Today we're going to be looking at how we can use Microsoft Excel to produce a graphical and mathematical relationship between variables. When you first open up Microsoft Excel, you're going to see a blank spreadsheet that consists of a lot of blank rectangles. Each of these rectangles is called a cell, and in the cell we can type in our values. Vertical stacks of cells are called columns. We have column A, column B, column C, and so forth. Horizontal stacks of cells are going to be called rows, row one, row two, and row three. It's important to keep that in mind because as we go a bit more into Excel, we'll want to reference specific cells by referring to the column and the row. This cell is A1, this is B2, this is C3, and then we can just reference any cell we want. Typically, I'll start off in cell A1. This is the very first cell we have access to, and that's what we're going to be typing in. Today, we're going to be looking at an example lab of the relationship between volume and mass. In this lab, we would have calculated the volume by measuring the height, width, and length dimensions, and then we would have just had multiple trials of the mass at each volume. So in Excel, I'm going to type in all of the variables we would have measured or calculated, and then we'll populate it with some sample data. So in cell A1, I'm going to type in my first measurement, which would have been the height measured in centimeters. So you just type into the cell, you hit enter, and then that will be your, well, first cell that you're referencing. You might not be able to see it super well, so I'm actually going to zoom in to make it a little bit easier to see. Height measured in centimeters. One thing you can probably see right now is that within the size of this rectangle, it kind of cuts off that last little bit of our unit of measure. That's okay, we'll fix that later. Let's just finish setting up the data table first. So the next measurement we've had would have been the width, also measured in centimeters, and then the length, also measured in centimeters. Once we had all three of those, we would have calculated the volume by multiplying the height by the width by the length. So this is going to be our volume that would be measured in centimeters cubed. Now there's not a really easy way to do an exponent or a superscript with that three. Um, I can show you that later on if you're interested, but right now, this is just an easy way to show it. I did that caret symbol to show that this is an exponent. So this would have been our independent variable. Our height, width, and length are the things that we directly measured, and then we would have had to calculate the volume. And then we would have measured our mass in grams. But for a good lab, we want to do this measurement multiple times. So we'll do three trials of it. So this will be mass in grams, trial one. This will be mass in grams of trial two. This will be mass in grams of trial three. And then once we have however many trials we're going with, typically three or more, then we would average together all of those individual trials to determine the average value. Once we have that, we can just underneath each of these type in the measurements. So this first one would have been 1.20. I will hit the tab button to move to the right. We would have measured 1.06 for the width and 1.11 for the centimeters of length. Now I could manually calculate the volume and then type that in here. But after I collect all of my data, I'll just use Excel to do the calculations for me. And then I'll just drag that down. So I'm going to leave this blank for now. In the lab, we would have collected three trials of mass data. So 3.24, 3.20, and 3.21. And then once again, while I could manually determine the average mass, I can also use Excel to calculate it for me. So I'll leave that blank right now. So you'll do this you'll, while you're collecting your data, you'll type it up in Excel. Just so that way you don't have to watch me type in all these numbers. I'm just going to copy uh, these data I've already typed up in a separate spreadsheet. So let me just paste that really quick. Oh, here we go. And here we go. So this would have been all the data we've collected. One thing that I'm going to do is I'm now going to show us how we can use Excel to calculate these values. So for our volume, the way we would have calculated the volume in this would have been multiplying the height by the width by the length. So to use Excel to do that calculation for us, we're going to type in to the selected cell that we want the measurement to show up in, equal. 
and then I'm going to click on the values I want to do. So I want to take the height, 1.2, multiplied by the width, 1.06, multiplied by the length, 1.11. And then once I have set up my equation, I will hit enter, and it will do the calculation for me. Now, you can do that manually each time, but one of the reasons why Excel is such a useful tool for us in our data collection is that once we have this reference once, we can click on it and drag down. And up at the top where it says fill, you can fill down. What it'll do is it'll take those reference cells and then when you shift it down, it will shift the references down and it will do the exact same calculation for you every single time. So that way you don't have to manually do the same calculation multiple times. Excel will do all of that redundant work for you. Here are all of the volumes we would have used. We can do the exact same thing for our mass. Well, the average mass. So it's equal to, to figure out the average, we would add up each of those three cells and then divide by the number we have, in this case, three. Now, the fact that we have three masses, 3.24 grams, 3.2 grams, and 3.21 grams, means our average mass should be somewhere around 3.2. Yet when I hit enter, that average mass was significantly larger than what we would have expected the average to be. This is going to be one of those things to be careful about when you're trying to use Microsoft Excel to do math for you. This is a calculator. It follows the order of operations exactly. The fact that we set it up like this means that the third trial is being divided by three, and then that quotient is going to be added to those other two trials. We can fix that by using parentheses, which would say add up those three trials first, and then divide by the three trials that we have. And then that would solve it for us. Alternatively, some very common measurements in Excel, such as averages. The programmers have set up functions for us to use. So we can do equals, and then if we start typing the word average, we have a bunch of already formulated functions and formulas that will do these different calculations for us. This first one says average. So if I double click on it, it will average. And then it's saying, select what numbers you want to average. So I can click and drag over all the trials I have, close parentheses, enter. And it'll do that same measurement for us. And then just as before, we can fill down. And then we have all of our values that we're going to need to graph, volume and average mass. However, before we get to that, let's finish making this data table actually look, you know, good. Because right now I am not loving the fact that all of these cells are cutting off what we're looking at. So one thing that I'll do is I will select all of my data and I want to make sure everything fits. So if I were to select like this, I can then just click on the end, end margin here where my cursor changes to a different shape. If I were to double click, it will try to set an appropriate width for each column that will allow you to fit all of your measurements in there. However, the one thing I don't love about this is the widths of each column vary, and I don't think that looks very good. I want them all to be uniform in width. So an alternative way to do that would be to, after you've selected everything, go up to where it says format at the top, cells format, and I can set a column width that I'm happy with. Typically, my default is going to be 15. You can increase or decrease that to make it work a little bit more. Let me zoom out now that we've expanded this. Okay, so 15 seems to fit even our most well populated cell, which looks like it'll be the average mass. So this does a much better job of us being able to see everything that we have here. One thing I wanna do is to be able to separate my variables and their units of measure from the data. So one thing I can do is I can just change what those words look like. I've selected them. I can then go up here where it says font and click B for bold. 
and that will bold all of my cells. But I still don't love the way that this looks because all of my words are on the left side of each of those cells and all of my numbers are on the right side. I want to fix that and make it uniform. So once again, I can select all of my data and then next to where it says font, there's an alignment. We can align all the values in each cell so they're uniform. We have ways to align the vertical position within the cell as well as the horizontal. My general rule of thumb is just to center, center all of your content. Looks a little bit better there. There are other things I want to fix though. One thing that I'm looking at, especially coming from a background of chemistry, is that I want to represent the correct amount of significant figures for each measured value. Because for this height here, this very first one, which is 1.2 centimeters, when I type that into my cell originally, you would have seen me do 1.20 because I would have had that amount of significant figures on my measuring device. However, when I type that in exactly the way that I recorded it and hit enter, Excel rounds it and just says it's 1.2 exactly. I want to force Excel to use my correct number of places past the decimal point. To do that, I can click on, click on all of these cells that I want to set to that specific value. All of these will be measured to two places past the decimal. So I've selected them, and then there are a few things I can do. I can right click and go to format cells, and then say this is a number with two places past the decimal. Alternatively, up at the top where it says number, I can just change the number of places past the decimal. I can click on this drop down where it says general and then say this is specifically a number and then it defaults to two, but I can adjust the measurements here. That makes it look a bit more consistent and uniform. Instead of having numbers that look different, they're all in the same scale. Now for my calculated column, these volumes, once again, the number of places past decimal are all over the place and that just does not look good. I want to set this as a number. And while I could continue with my understanding from chemistry and use the appropriate number of sig figs with our calculations, for physics, I might just be okay making sure it's a consistent number of places past the decimal point, which is what I'm going to keep it as. Two places past the decimal point, so that way it's all an appropriate scale. I'm going to do the same thing for my masses and my average mass. Let's say that these are all numbers, all the same scale, it cleans up our data pretty well. Oops. This data table looks much better. And if I were to print it exactly as it is, this is what it would look like on a sheet of paper. Now that I actually look at what the print preview would be, I don't actually love the format. It just looks incomplete. I want to border it and make it look a little bit neater and more professional. So the way that I'm going to do that is go back and actually and close it. An easy way to do that is select all the data and the titles that you want to enclose. And then back in the font section up here at the top, instead of focusing on any of the text, you can focus on this little drop down menu that has a rectangle and a drop down menu next to it. This is where you can border things. My general rule of thumb is just to put outside borders on, in which case, you notice we now have this black line that's bordering it. You can't really see it up here or over here, but if we were to go back to the print preview screen, you can see it's kind of bordered. Oh, and it looks like it's actually cutting off some of our data. I can probably fix that by changing the orientation of the paper. And then maybe fitting all columns on one page. Okay, so it would fully enclose all of our data here. Once again, it still looks a little incomplete. I want to better demarcate the variables and units from the values. So to do that, I'm just going to once again, select those values and then outside borders. Let's see how that looks now. Okay, that looks pretty good now. So we clearly have our titles up here for all the variables and units of measure. We clearly have all of our values. All the values are consistent in the number of places past the decimal that we have. We have everything centered justified so it looks neat and organized. This is great. Now that we have this set up, we can actually graph it. Because ultimately, the reason why we do these labs is to produce a graphical and mathematical relationship. So I'm going to insert a graph. 
there are a couple ways you can do that. You can actually select the values you want to graph and then trust Excel to graph it correctly for you. But instead, what I like to do is I like to just click on a blank cell on my spreadsheet, go up to the top where it says insert, click insert, and then over here where it's charts. I'm just going to insert a blank chart. Now in this class, we should only be inserting scatter plots. I go with this very first scatter plot. I'm going to move that down here just so that way it's not covering up our data table. And at this point, I can probably zoom out a little bit. So that way we have our chart and our data table all within the same visual image. But right here, this is just a blank chart. We need to add data to it. So once you've inserted that, I'm going to right click on the chart. And then I'm going to select data. Click on that. And then we have this whole select data source uh, pop up for us. Now you can have like an entire data range if you want, but typically what I do is down here where it says legend entries, parentheses series. I like to add. You can give it a name if you're going to be graphing multiple data sets, but really you don't need to. Where it says series X values, I'll click on this up arrow and that will allow me to click and drag on whatever cells I want to graph. On my X axis is where I want to graph my volume. So I'm going to click on my very first volume data and then click and drag down. So that will reference, it's on sheet one, it goes from cell D2 to D9, which are all these values here. I click on that down arrow now, and then it gives me my X values. I'll do the same thing with my Y values, which is where I'm going to be putting the average mass. Click on the first one, drag down. We can see that it's referencing this sheet with those cells, click down, and then here is our data. So we can click okay. If we wanted to add extra relationships we can but right now we're just going to be focusing on the one so we have this set up and we're hitting okay at this point here is a graph but it's missing significant elements that allow it to be useful so the way that we can set that up is on the top right of your chart there should be a plus sign this is where we can add elements to the chart by default it will be axes a chart title and grid lines those are great to leave on but we also want to add axis titles so we know what's on the y and the x axis as well as a trend line so now that we have that set up let's make sure that this graph looks the way we want it to my y axis goes from 0 to 600 the of the two data sets that i selected the mass is the one that goes up to about 500 so that definitely would correspond our y axis will be our mass so I'm going to put the axis title as mass in grams. So we want the variable and the unit of measure. For the x-axis, it goes from 0 to 250, and that really matches our volumes. So my axis title for the x-axis will be volume measured in centimeters to the third power, those cubic centimeters. Now for the chart title, we don't need to be fancy with it. A perfectly good and straightforward chart title that works every single time is y-axis variable versus x-axis variable. So in this case, it would be mass versus volume. This is one of those things that we're looking for in a lab, a graphical relationship between mass and volume, between one variable and the other. The other thing that we're looking for in our labs is a mathematical relationship. We can actually use Excel to calculate that for us. So instead of us having to figure out what two points fall directly on that line of best fit, using point slope formulas to figure out the slope and the y-intercepts and then using that as our math equation, Excel will do all of that math for us. So I'm going to click on the trend line, right click, and then select format trend line. That will open up this option on the right side of your screen. This is where, if we did not have a straight line graph, we could select what relationship we believe it is. And we'll see that in the future, but right now this is a straight line graph. Down on the bottom, we have an option to set an intercept if we know for a fact what the y-intercept should be. We don't, don't click that option. 
But one thing that we do want is this one right here, display equation on chart. If we click on that box, it will give us an equation with a mathematically correct slope and y-intercept. This will be the foundation of our mathematical relationship between these two variables. Now, right here, this is what we're looking for, and I really want to emphasize its importance. So I'm actually going to bold it and then maybe increase the font size to make it a little bit easier for me to see and read it. But right here, this is going to be our graph and math relationships we're looking at. There are lots of options once you try to format the chart options, and you can play around with that and look at it. But this right here is really good for what we're looking at. Once you have this set up, you can print it out. We have a properly formatted data table, and then we have a properly formatted graph. The only thing I'd recommend doing at this point is maybe trying to maximize the space you're using when you print this out. Because look at all this blank sp space that we'd be using on that sheet of paper. We could probably increase this chart to fill up that space so that way it's a bit more professional, properly using our space. So I will go back to this and then just increase this. One thing you might see is that there's this dash line that we have down here. After you try to print something in Excel, even if you don't print it out, it will give you the option of having these dash lines here. And that will be the limit of one sheet of paper. So I can click and drag on this. So that way it gets pretty close to that limit. And that will maximize my space. And I just want to make sure it doesn't go over. Yeah, it doesn't go over perfectly. So let's see how that looks. Control P. Lovely. It's still going to just be a single sheet of paper. But here, we're using pretty much all of our possible space. This is what we'll be looking for when we're looking for a printout of our data table and our graph. It should look clear, professional, and has all the information that we need.